Markets took a breather this week as the NASDAQ pulled back 1.5%. Hello and welcome back to the Wall Street Petting Zoo. This is our This Week at the Zoo segment in which we review the previous week's market news and look ahead to the coming week. I'm Christopher Smith. And I'm Robert Coburn. Economic data was very mixed this week, so let's kick off the podcast by digging into the numbers. Initial jobless claims came in slightly above expectations this week and 8% above the previous week for the first increase in 16 weeks. Uh, Continuing jobless claims decreased, so it looks like companies are still bringing employees back to work, but a household survey put out by the Census Bureau showed the overall national employment was down about 2.5% from its peak in June. Even more concerning than the jobs data is the wages data. About 11.5% of U.S. workers have had their wages cut since February, nearly twice as many as during the financial crisis of 2008. Travel data was mixed as well. TSA numbers ticked downward this week, but the Federal Reserve Mobility Index ticked upward. The ratio of insider selling to insider buying has soared to its highest in decades, which suggests that corporate executives are feeling pessimistic about their company's futures. But PMI data show that the services and manufacturing sector increased business investment in July, which implies that those sectors are feeling optimistic. I think the overall story in the economic data is that the current spike in COVID-19 cases has definitely paused the economy's reopening, but it hasn't quite reversed it. The economic data have have just sort of flattened and stock prices have flattened along with them. Yeah, let's talk for a minute about the progress of the pandemic, Robert. The the number of new COVID-19 cases in the US looks like it may have peaked last week and started to decline this week. That's good news, especially for the Southern United States, which saw the most pronounced decline in new cases. Uh, but cases are still rising in the Midwest. It's looking more and more like this pandemic may be controllable through wearing masks. And we're seeing a little bit more buy-in from people in the South and Midwest on mask mandates. Uh, So hopefully states won't have to completely shut down to uh, control the pandemic. Uh, So it's possible that we'll see some flattening of the coronavirus curve without a major decline in economic activity. Uh, And as long as we're on the subject, it's worth mentioning this week, the team at Oxford that's uh, developing a vaccine for AstraZeneca reported positive trial results for their vaccine candidate this week. So that's good news. And the U.S. government also gave Pfizer uh, $2 billion to manufacture 100 million doses of its vaccine candidate by the end of the year. So it's just possible that we will get a working vaccine by the end of the year. Uh, I'm allowing myself to hope on that. And we should get some more concrete information on that within the next couple months here. The economy may not be going strongly up or down, Chris, but we're definitely seeing the pandemic reorganize the economy somewhat. And a great example of that is people fleeing the cities for the suburbs. Apartment rents are down almost 12% in San Francisco year over year and down about 5% in Manhattan. Apartment vacancies in the cities have been climbing, and office building vacancies are even worse. But meanwhile, housing prices are soaring in the suburbs, and home sales, housing starts, and lumber prices have all been really high. There are probably going to be some good opportunities to snap up inner-city real estate on the cheap. Yeah, I saw uh, this week, I saw that one of the major commercial real estate firms in New York said that it had uh, only 3% occupancy in its, in its properties in New York. Uh, and I also have seen projections that even after the pandemic is over, uh, some of these REITs are expecting you know, occupancy and commercial real estate to be down like 15% on a permanent basis because companies have realized that they can uh, have employees work from home and that that's cheaper for them to do. So it should be really interesting to see. I think that the commercial real estate market is maybe not going to fully recover coming out of this pandemic. Uh, So might be an opportunity to short some of those commercial REITs. Uh, Speaking of reorganizing the economy, we may be right on the verge of a major structural shift in the global economy. Uh, For 10 years, the dollar has been getting stronger compared to other world currencies. And as a result, the U.S. stock market has also outperformed world stocks. But the dollar index plunged this week 
and it's sitting right on top of its 10 year trend line. If the dollar were to break below this trend line, it could signal the start of a new 10 year cycle of underperformance by the US dollar and US stocks. Uh, this does tend to seesaw back and forth in roughly 10 year cycles. So we're at the end of a 10 year cycle right now where the US dollar has been outperforming and US stocks have been outperforming. So we're probably due to enter a new down cycle for US stocks and the US dollar. Uh, but it's going to be really interesting and really important to watch that trend line this week and see if the dollar holds that trend line, bounces from it, or breaks below it this week. Uh, so that's the news for the week. Let's talk stocks we watched last week. What were you watching, Robert? So last week I called out that I was continuing to watch video game stocks to see if there's another buying opportunity before the quarterly earnings reports in the first week of August. Now, other than Take-Two Interactive, most of the video game stocks ended the week slightly in the green. Uh, although with this next week being the week before earnings reports, they could see either a spike or a dip as traders decide if they should cash out or double down. Uh, Zax is giving a two rating, which is buy for Tencent and Zynga, whereas Take-Two and Activision Blizzard have a, a rating of three, which is hold. So take that as you will. Uh, I was also watching airline stocks, which all fell after the reports from American Southwest and Alaska Air this past week, which collectively had billions of dollars in losses. Despite the bad reports, some analysts are maintaining a buy rating on Southwest due to its strong liquidity in comparison to its counterparts. Uh, I will be continuing to watch the TSA data and COVID cases uh, because any lifts in international travel bans uh, would cause the airline stocks to rise. Uh, what about you, Chris? What are you watching? Well, last week I called out Taiwan Semiconductor, the consumer staples and banking sectors, and precious metals like gold and silver. And it was a really good week for all of those calls. Taiwan Semiconductor ended the week up more than 10% because Intel announced a 12 month delay in the release of its new seven nanometer chips. Uh, those chips would compete directly with Taiwan Semiconductor's chips. Uh, and so Taiwan Semiconductor should see stronger chip demand over the next 12 months as a result of no competition from Intel. And so it shot up quite a bit on Friday. Uh, consumer staples and banking both outperformed the indexes this week, gaining a percent or so while the indexes were down for the week. And gold and silver went on an absolute tear this week, especially silver. Gold gained 5%, while silver gained an amazing 18% in a single week, catching up with gold for the year. Uh, I made several hundred percent on an option call in silver, and uh, <laughs> one of those situations where you kind of kick yourself and wish that you had bought more. <laughs> what are you watching this week, Robert? Yeah, on top of the airlines and video game stocks, I'll be watching uh, CDW. Now, they sell computer hardware and software licenses primarily to corporations and small businesses across U.S., Canada, and the U.K., and with companies increasing their spending on hardware for their remote workforce, uh, I think CDW will beat expectations when they report earnings on Wednesday. Additionally, I will be looking at Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, they recently announced the permanent closure of nearly 450 stores due to COVID, so I can only imagine how abysmal the earnings reports will be on Thursday before the market opens. The stock didn't negatively react with when the news broke of the store closures. So this may be an opportunity to either short Duncan or buy in after the earnings comes out for the longer term play. Uh, what stocks will you be watching this week, Chris? I am watching as banks creep upward toward a critical trend line, and I may buy into a banking ETF if it makes a bullish cross on that trend line. Uh, bond yields have fallen hard this week, and the big investment banks have made a lot of money this year betting on falling bond yields. So if bond yields are continuing to fall, then uh, banks may see like big revenues on their next earnings report. They may beat on the next earnings report. So. That's one reason that I think banks outperform the market a little bit this week. However, uh, the Moody's credit rating agency forecasts that the outlook for banks' consumer loan portfolios is going to get worse before it gets better, with the low point due sometime in 2021. Um, so I'm not sure how to play this because it seems like there are big losses coming for banks in that consumer loan segment. 
But it also seems like banks are prepared for that. They've already set aside the cash to cover those losses so that they won't affect future earnings. They, uh, they set aside big cash piles on this last report. Um, and that is why their earnings pretty much missed across the board is because they were setting aside those cash piles, taking the loss now so that they won't have to take it on future quarters. Um, so, you know, I'm assuming that they are relatively prepared for this uh, downturn in consumer credit that's coming. So I'm just going to watch that trend line and I'm going to kind of follow the market's cues. I do see some evidence of hedge funds repositioning into banks. And if we cross that trend line, then I think that'll be a pretty decisive signal that uh, sentiment has changed on banks and that the market expects banks to recover from here. Uh, other than that, I've almost completely exited the market right now. It looks to me like the stimulus package may still be a few weeks away. So I'm going to kind of hold on a little bit until I see some signs that that stimulus uh, is starting to move forward. And I'm also seeing that the Republican proposal is $1 trillion rather than the $3.5 trillion package that the Democrats proposed. And obviously, a much smaller stimulus package would be much less bullish for stocks. So I'm keeping a close eye on the size of the package as well as the potential date that we could get some news about it. So I think that until I see some some more indications of what's going to happen with the stimulus package, I'm going to stay mostly out of this market. It's looking pretty weak right now and additionally pretty overvalued. So folks, that's our episode for this week. If you heard something useful on the podcast, please give us a like, share, or comment on YouTube. We'd love if you would share our podcast on Twitter or on Facebook or even on Instagram, whichever social media network you use, we would love to have you share us on there. Help us get the word about the podcast because we don't do any advertising. And if you would like to support the podcast, we've got a referral link underneath the YouTube video for uh, Webull. Webull is a trading platform that uh, we find to be really useful, has lots of great analytics tools, highly recommend it. And if you sign up for Webull and deposit $100, then we get a couple free stocks and that helps support the podcast. Again, we really appreciate your support. And we will see you back at the zoo next week. See you.